At different points in time, more than one kind of human was alive at the same time. Hominins first evolved in Africa. The bipedal hominins who first appeared between seven to six million years ago were arboreal with bipedal capabilities. But by four million years ago in Africa, they were fully bipedal Australopithecines, but still retaining some climbing abilities. Homo erectus was a fully terrestrial biped, now dating as early as two million years ago in South Africa. Homo erectus was thought to have evolved in Africa and was long thought to be the first hominin to leave Africa during the early Pleistocene. But now early Pleistocene finds of stone tools without skeletons <clears throat> and of Homo erectus bones outside of Africa clear over to China and Indonesia call this first migratory wave into question. To summarize, the earliest bones of Homo in Africa include Homo habilis, dating from 2.4 to 1.4 million years ago in East and South Africa, and Homo erectus, dating as early as 2 million years ago in South Africa and going up to 110,000 years ago. So the earliest Homo erectus coexisted with Australopithecus africanus and Paranthropus robustus in South Africa near the Dremolan cave. But Oldowan tradition stone tools first made by Homo habilis or perhaps also by Australopithecines, but continued to be made by Homo erectus. But these kinds of stone tools dating to 2.1 million years ago have been found in Western China. That's earlier than the earliest Homo erectus found in Africa. And a growing number of early Pleistocene sites with bones and or stone tools <clears throat> are being found in China and Indonesia. We now have an, a revised record of the earliest finds of hominins outside of Africa. As I've mentioned already, the oldest are 2.1 million year old Oldowan looking stone tools in Western China. And a wonderful record from 1.8 million years ago of not only stone tools, but Homo erectus bones in the Republic of Georgia. So the 2.1 million year old Oldowan looking stone tools were found in the Lantian province. 1.63 million years ago in the same area, a Homo erectus skull dated to that time was found. One of the researchers suggests that the Indonesian and Chinese populations of Homo erectus were the product of two different dispersal routes. Those in Java dispersed along a southern route, and whereas those in North China followed a northern route. So we're just now beginning to work out this dispersal of Homo erectus in Asia. The 2.1 million year old stone tools in Lantian, China were made from rocks collected five to 10 kilometers away. So they definitely were transported there by humans and include a large number of flaked stones, including cores, flakes, scrapers, um, notches, points or drills, and um, some picks or bifaces, and a couple of hammer stones that show wear from hammering. At Demancy site in the Republic of Georgia, they found five skulls, four mandibles, and 100 postcranial remains of primitive looking Homo erectus, along with stone tools. During the early Pleistocene, it was a forested, relatively humid, but temperate environment with cool winters. They found over 10,000 stone tools, including flakes and choppers in the Oldowan tradition, and many animal bones. Here you see one of the very primitive looking Homo erectus skulls from Demancy. The stone tools dating to 1.66 million years ago in the North China. This site was located on a lake or marsh edge and the stone tools are similar to Oldowan, but they're not made on pebbles. The animal bones had been bashed open for marrow and these animals included elephant, horse, hyena, rhinoceros, deer, gazelle, and ostrich. So I can't begin to answer which species of Homo first migrated out of Africa at the Pliocene-Pleistocene boundary, or even where Homo erectus first evolved. 
Did they first evolve in Africa or did they evolve in Asia? The point is that as early as the beginning of the Pleistocene, by 1.8 million years ago or shortly thereafter, Homo erectus populations were spread all the way from South Africa over into Indonesia, including out into the islands around Java. And this calls into question, where did anatomically modern Homo sapiens evolve or begin? And we'll cover this in the next class. This map shows the extent of the Homo erectus populations. Now remember, this is during the Pleistocene, so areas north of here would have been uninhabitable. So the fact that Homo erectus populations were so widespread and that the following archaic populations were so widespread raises interesting questions about the evolution of modern Homo sapiens. More recently, more than one kind of human lived in the same areas at the same time in Eurasia. And these were Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis, and the Denisovans. I can make some generalized statements about all three of their societies at this time. They all had egalitarian societies. That's a society in which everyone has access to the basic needs of life. An egalitarian society is not a society in which everyone had the same social status. There has never been any such human society. So what is status? It's a social role with both rights and obligations. An individual status in egalitarian societies is based on age, sex, and whether you're married or not. Leadership would have been earned by achievement by adults. Kinship would have been very important. You would have had a web of obligations, very much like living in a small town in South Carolina today. They probably lived in isolated families or small bands of less than 30 people. Their subsistence strategy or how they obtained food was that they were hunter-gatherers. In other words, they depended entirely on wild food. They had language, they all controlled fire, they all wore clothing, and they built shelters. Now I'll talk about each group separately, beginning with the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals are one regional population of archaic Homo who lived around the Mediterranean between 200,000 to 27,000 years ago. You notice on this map, the areas in dark brown are areas that were exposed, but now would be underwater. So during the glaciation, during the ice age, the glaciers would have taken up ocean water, dropped the ocean level, exposing areas that now you would have to do underwater archaeology to examine. So we're lacking um, knowledge about the what would have been coastal sites at that time that now are out to sea underwater. The Neanderthals disappeared as the last glacial maximum began, a time of intense cold spells and temperature fluctuations. Most Neanderthal sites date between 120 to 35,000 years ago. Only a few um, exist all the way up to 27,000 years ago. The area that they occupied in Southern Europe was an area of abundant limestone caves where Neanderthal skeletal remains are preserved. Now they never lived deep inside caves. They lived at the openings of caves where the sunlight still came in. Paleoanthropologists generally agree that Neanderthals lived in groups of only 10 to 15 counting their children. And that assessment is based on a few lines of evidence, including the limited remains at burial sites and the modest size of the rock shelters that they occupied. They did build shelters, for ex example, by erecting windbreaks across cave entrances or windbreaks across a rock shelter entrance. And they also built shelters in the open. We know also, as depicted in this painting, that uh, within at least uh, this cave depicted, they had uh, separate areas where they um, uh, flint napped or where they cooked um, and so that they actually had kind of sequestered or 
um, what they were doing where uh, within the entrance to this cave. The glass, last glaciation unfortunately destroyed many of the open sites because as the glaciers advance or retreat, they kind of wipe out what's on the landscape. So we know about the Neanderthals mostly from the rock shelter or cave entrance sites. But Neanderthal sites were lived in longer than before. We find a greater depth to the deposits or trash. We think they may have been short-term settlements that were reused. Think about it. As your toolkit becomes larger, it becomes more difficult to be mobile. How are you going to lug around all your tools all the time? Subsistence refers to their diet or what they ate. And Neanderthals hunted both small and large game, including mammoths and rhinos. They also gathered plant food. The faunal assemblages at several sites have a heavy bias on one large game animal. In other words, they were choosing to hunt that animal. And apparently, they sometimes drove them over cliffs. Tools for hunting took on more standardized shapes, as opposed to tools for other tasks. The Neanderthals are associated with the Mosterian tool tradition during what's called the Middle Paleolithic or Middle Stone Age cultural period. Most tools were probably made of wood, but those have not been preserved. The stone tools preserve better, and that's what we depend upon to talk about these early societies. They used a level law technique to create a specific shape, what we call a prepared core from which they could then knock off flakes of a certain shape. So in other words, they had a mental template and a set pattern and a series of steps that you had to follow to make their tools. It was quite complicated. They also made composite tools or compound tools, tools that require multiple parts, such as spears with wooden handles. You would have the wood uh, handle, the stone tip, and then you would have some kind of glue to hold it in, maybe some sinew to also help hold the um, spear tip into the wooden handle. They also hafted cutting or scraping tools. In fact, one point was found on a beach that still had some of the glue attached. And so um, archeologists analyzed it. Here you see a reconstruction. It was birch bark, sticky tar from birch bark which we think they also chewed as a chewing gum. On the right, you see some of the typical Mousterian uh, tools made by Neanderthals. The extreme wear pattern on the front teeth of many Neanderthals indicates that they use their front teeth as tools also. And in particular, this uh, skeleton's mouth that you see on the left is called Shanadar One. He was a male from a, uh, a site in Iraq who'd lost his right arm at the elbow and he'd been using his front teeth to compensate. Look at that extreme wear pattern on his front incisors. About 40,000 years ago, just before modern Homo sapiens arrived in the area, they innovated their tools and began making long thin blades, which I'll show you what those look like in a minute, and hafting more tools. They also began making more personal ornaments, such as bone, ivory, and tooth pendants worn on necklaces. You can see here um, the little holes that they drilled or little lines that they made, um, incised lines so that they could hang them on a necklace. And they also used more mineral pigments to color things, whether they were painting their clothing or their faces, it's difficult to say. They made clothing out of hides. Of course, the clothing, the hides are not preserved, but we do have the tools that were used to tan the hides. For example, these smoothed rib bones from two sites in southern France would have been used to tan the hides. And these bone awls would have been used for sewing, for punching holes. And in fact, a short length of cordage, the earliest known cordage in the world, made from the inner bark has been found. It was wrapped around a flake, shown here. The little box shows you the teeny piece that was found. This dates to 41 to 52,000 years ago from a site in France. 
On the right, it's got various kinds of ways of photographing it, but in the top center, you can see an artist reconstruction of the complexity of this thread, where they first uh, twisted the fiber one way and then took three strands and twisted them together the opposite way. So this shows a sophistication that we had no idea that the Neanderthals had. They also made musical instruments. Several bone flutes have been found. This one dates back to 43,000 years ago. A friend of mine who uh, works at a university in Germany was one of those who found one of these flutes. And you can listen to someone playing on a reconstructed Neanderthal flute that had been made from the femur of a cave bear. So I recommend that you come back and listen to this music. It's, it's very eerie. The Neanderthals are the first human known to bury their dead. Not necessarily all their dead, but they did bury some people. And when 36 burials had been analyzed, we found that they had dug a grave, they'd positioned the body. For example, this one you see was bundled up uh, as reconstructed in the artist's painting. And that they, 40% of them have utilitarian stone tools or animal bones when there are grave goods or offerings put in the grave. In fact, Neanderthal child berries, burials were more elaborate than those of adults, suggesting strong emotional bonds and the important role that children played in the social group. Neanderthal life expectancy was low. They commonly died in their 20s and certainly in their 30s. And out of 246 analyzed skeletons, nearly 40% died before adulthood. Of the remaining 152 adults, only 8.6% reached the age of 40 years old or older. Almost every Neanderthal skeleton has healed fractures, or at least adult skeleton, probably from the dangers of hunting big game like mammoths and rhinos up close using just a spear. And there are several instances of crippled people who must have been cared for and kept alive by others. We find evidence of symbolism, including the burial of dead at about 17 sites, the use of pigments such as red ochre and manganese dioxide. Manganese dioxide would give you a black dye. And one burial found with medicinal flowers placed on the chest of the person. One article claims that the Neanderthal were using feathers from bird wings. And at 176,000 years ago in a cave in southern France, Neanderthals built six semicircular structures using broken off stalagmites deep inside a cave. Now, no one ever lived deep inside a cave. They must have been doing something back there instead, uh, maybe some kind of rituals. There are no associated skeletons, no artifacts, and these would not have been for living in. So Neanderthals and modern Homo sapiens appear to have overlapped in Europe for at least 5,000 years. Homo sapiens was in northern Bulgaria by 46,000 years ago, and perhaps these earliest pioneers arrived in small bands. And we have ancient as well as modern evidence that Neanderthals and modern Homo sapiens did sometimes interbreed. The Denisovans ranged across Asia during the Lower and Upper Paleolithic. So this map shows you the Archaics over into Southern Europe, the Neanderthals in Eurasia, and the Denisovans uh, ranging all the way down into Asia. The Denisovans are known from only a few specimens from two places, Denisova Cave itself in South Central Siberia in the Altai Mountains, and the Baishia Karst Cave on the Tibetan Plateau in China. And this was a high altitude site. So little is known of the precise anatomical features of the Denisovans, since the only physical remains discovered so far, this is incredible, are a finger bone, three teeth, long bone fragments, a partial jawbone, and a parietal bone skull fragment. 
However, based on their DNA, we can tell they were closely related to Neanderthals and apparently had dark skin, brown hair, and brown eyes. As much as 17% of the Denisovan genome from Denisova Cave represents DNA from the local Neanderthal population. Though the remains have been identified in only two locations, traces of Denisovan DNA in modern humans suggest that they ranged across East Asia and potentially into Western Eurasia. One bone fragment from Denisova Cave in Siberia dating to 90,000 years ago was a female who was at least 13 years old. And we can tell that her mother was a Neanderthal from Europe but her father was Denisovan from Siberia. So this is a story that wouldn't we love to know. <laughs> Homo sapiens. Well, the earliest evidence of Homo sapiens in Europe is during a warm interglacial dating to 46,000 years ago in a cave entrance in Bulgaria. There, they butchered bison, wild horses, and cave bears, and left a toolkit that archaeologists call Aurignacian, which is characterized by lithic tools made on blades. Now, traditionally, the advent of the Homo sapiens toolkit signaled the beginning of the Upper Paleolithic cultural period. But now, that division is breaking down as more sites are found, and particularly as we find early technological advances in South Africa and we better appreciate the sophistication of the Neanderthals. What is a blade? Well, it's a particular type of flake that requires you to first make what we call a prepared core. And here I show you uh, four different prepared cores. You can see that you, you need to prepare them to make a particular shape. Once you've made that shape, you, it is kind of like the first factory production. You can quickly knock off these blades once that shape is made, but obviously you have to have a mental template and understand how to make, how to prepare to make a blade. So a blade is very long and narrow. It's at least twice as long as it is wide. It has parallel sides that are very sharp edged. On that blade on the bottom right, on the left hand side, it shows you at the top where the next blades will be coming off each one. So you would knock off on the ridge, off would pop a blade, a blade and you could just go around, bam, 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 and knock off uh, blades as fast as possible. So some blades are large and you can hold them in your hand <clears throat> or you could flint nap them into something else. Some are very small and you might wonder, well, how could you use these teeny tiny blades? Well, you would have them and in fact, uh, maybe inset a whole bunch of them into, say, the uh, jawbone of an ass, and you would have like a hacksaw blade. However, we're finding blade tools as early as 100,000 years ago in South Africa, on the very south tip of Africa at the Clazies River mouth. And uh, at the time, of course, given their age, they were called Middle Stone Age. But this is the kind of technology that we used to associate it with only the upper or upper stone age. So um, like I said, this, this division into upper stone age or upper Pleistocene is falling apart. Homo sapiens made complicated composite or compound tools. That is tools that consist of multiple parts that fit together. For example, uh, barbed bone harpoons have been found in Zaire. Central Africa dating to 90,000 years ago. These were used to spear huge prehistoric catfish weighing as much as 68 kilograms or 150 pounds, enough to feed 80 people for two days. Modern Homo sapiens in Europe are thought to have lived in larger groups and had a bigger social network than had the Neanderthals before them, which is perhaps why the Neanderthals died out and Homo sapiens lived on. Their subsistence base was as varied, if not more, than the Neanderthals' subsistence base, and they probably moved seasonally between settlements. <clears throat> they buried their dead, they made art, and I'll talk more on that in the next section of the course, 
and they made musical instruments. And for the five to 10,000 years of overlap in Europe with Neanderthals, some interbreeding took place, and we can see it in our modern genome today. Here's an interesting um, something. In the Russian plains, where trees would have been scarce or small, modern Homo sapiens used mammoth bones to build structures. And in fact, they sometimes burned the bone because they didn't have any wood to burn. And here's a reconstruction in a museum of what one of these little structures would have looked like. Now, one unusually large structure made of 60 mammoths was recently uncovered. It boggles the mind. And it was not a normal habitation structure. <clears throat> this was found dating to 25,000 years ago at an upper Paleolithic site near Moscow. And here's an aerial view of it looking down. It was occupied during the Greenland Stadial Three at the onset of the last glacial maximum. In other words, it was so cold that most other people had left the area. Here's a close up of some of the bones, including a vertebra that are still, uh, they would have still been connected when they were deposited. <coughs> So we have no idea what they were using this huge structure for um, or how you could even roof it. Uh, it was just incredible. To summarize, we're not sure which species first left Africa. Definitely Homo erectus did. But did some earlier hominins, such as Homo habilis or even Australopithecus? We simply don't know yet, but we have our suspicions. But by two million years ago, Humans are clear over in Asia, hundreds of miles away. And three types of humans lived in Europe and Asia during the Pleistocene, and we know that they met. These include Neanderthals, a type of late archaic human, Denisovans, another archaic human, and anatomically modern Homo sapiens. We know practically nothing of the Denisovans, hence, not yet assigning them a species or subspecies name, but they lived in Asia and were closely related to Neanderthals. The Neanderthals lived around the Mediterranean, and the Neanderthals were a lot more sophisticated than we formerly gave them credit for. So modern Homo sapiens and Neanderthals both occupied parts of Southern Europe at the same time for about five to 10,000 years ending around 27,000 years ago. Historically, Neanderthals were depicted as brutish and lacking language, but growing evidence shows that they were quite sophisticated and they had language. <clears throat>